Ian's over here for the second time, and uh, Roger and his wife Lydia mentioned their leadership to Common Ground um, Bloberg. So they have made a trek across this morning. Uh, Nikki, Roger's wife, and their three daughters uh, were here at the first service. Uh, Roger and I go way back, uh, late 90s. Both of us are Durban Natal boys, and so I've known Roger for uh, you know, close on 30 years. Um, and it's been you know, great to see you. You can trust him because he's a Natal, Natal boy, right? Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. 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 Cool. Done. Um, and uh, yeah, three, three daughters like myself. Um, I have, a, I have, a, I have a, um, a high school teenager now, Roger, so I'll give you a little bit of advice when you get to that stage. But that's two. That two. I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, but I'll give you some, some guesswork. But it's been yeah, really good to track with Roger. He's a fellow runner as well, he's a better runner than me. Um, <laughs> and uh, Roger, come up here, I'd love to pray for you. I, I just want to say I, I've known this guy for a very long time, um, an exceptional um, dad and friend, and uh, I trust him, and so um, yeah, please trust him and lean in. Um, I had the privilege of, of hearing you know, the sermon this the second time, and I'm excited for it. It's, it's really rich and timely, so yeah, thanks, Roger. I need to pray for you. Yeah, God, thank you for Roger, and thank you for this, this word that he has um, brought. Thank you, it is. is is God inspired, that you have led him, that your Holy Spirit has guided him, and it's a timely word for us um, as, a, as, a, as a community. It's just been uh, confirmed over and over by the way you've spoken to us this morning um, through the various churches <laughs> in the first service and this one. Um, God, that this is, um, this is of you, and God, so just give him your know, peace and guidance, and I just pray it touches our hearts, um, and you know, that we, we walk away closer to you, Jesus, because of this. So I thank you for Roger and his family. Amen. 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 <coughs> this is perfect. Thank you. Can you guys all hear me over there? Yeah. It's uh, really is a privilege uh, to bring the warmest of greetings from Common Ground Bloberg. Uh, one of my leadership team sent this message. Um, I, he says this. He says, uh, make sure that South Penn know that we love them and we trust their firm faith in Christ will lead to stories of life and love that will continue reaching our ears. And um, we really do just want to send love, greetings. We are rooting for you. We are stoked about this community and, um, and are, are delighted about what God's doing here with you. And um, sometimes you need an external voice to remind you how precious the church is, Jesus' church is. The community of God is sometimes the rhythms and the routines of life in church can just get quite familiar. And I want to remind you that the church isn't like the bowling club or the life saving club or the school club, whatever it is. The church is a people of God that really matter, that have a fundamental role in society and in your life. And so I hope that you just feel the fresh, wow, I'm part of a church. And it's different and it's unique and it's important. And one of the wonders of what it means to be the church is that every week we get to open the scriptures and uh, let God speak to us by his word. And so that's what we're going to do today. And I want to uh, invite you into a journey that would probably start by asking you this question. How well do you process your life? How well do you process your life? What does your processing look like? Do you process your life at all. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. We are entering the story after the resurrection. Jesus has lived a life that nobody imagined a human could ever live in incredible loving kindness, but not only that, in miraculous uh, ways that were just extra human. No human being can turn water into wine, can walk on water, can heal lame bodies, can do all that stuff. This is the, the Jesus that has died a death he certainly didn't deserve to die because he was the most remarkably undeserving person of a death. He was the embodiment of love. <laughs> love doesn't deserve to die unless that is the definition of love. And so he has died and three days later there is this report now that possibly this death wasn't final. Possibly something else is happening. And so Luke chapter 24 verse 13 says it like this. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, about 13 kilometers, maybe uh, 12, for those who need kilometers. They were talking to, with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Wow. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. 
One of them, named Philippus, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? He asked. There's a bit of comedic humor there, right? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since this all took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Imagine being on that walk, eh? What a remarkable experience. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? This is God's word. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is not uh, words on a page. It is uh, the story of God that uh, reads our lives, that makes sense of the brokenness and the, the distress and the hopes and the fears that we live in. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us today by your word and by your spirit, through your word, to, to hear you and to ha have your help as we go through this amazing passage uh, of the resurrected Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Two friends are walking on a road. It's a 12 kilometer walk. Mike, where's 12 kilometers from here? Simon's Town? Walk from here to Simon's Town. They're on a long walk. They are making their way there slowly. And while they do that, they are processing something very traumatic that's just happened. Now, it was three days ago that they saw the, 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 the body of Jesus nailed on a cross. This is, this is etched into their mind. You know when sometimes you look at the sun and you close your eyes and you see a shape or you look out at something bright and you see the shape. They would have seen the form of Jesus as he was hanging on that cross. That would have been the thing that absolutely traumatized them. That is still following them. It's still stuck in their minds. They're looking at this image. Every day they wake up, they're thinking, what did we just see? It's not only the trauma, but it's also the, 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 the disappointment. This was a, a friend and a leader that they had walked with. They, they were totally disappointed. He had said some stuff about being a Messiah, and their expectations of a Messiah meant that there was some real hope that some things would turn around. There was some political expectation. There was some relational expectation. They were mates with the guy who was possibly going to turn stuff around, and they were close to him, and they got to know him. And man, they hadn't just gotten to know him, they had fallen for him. They loved him. This was a dear person who was remarkable and close. This was like a, you know, the, the grandparent or the person you loved so much. They had walked with, he had spoken so much life over them. When no one else was listening, it felt like he was the one who was listening. When no one else cared about their lives, it seemed like he was someone who cared. And now he's died. And he's died in a gruesome and traumatic way. And so what do they do? Well, they don't do what many of us in our generation do. They don't shove it aside, pretend it never happened, do as little as possible to try and get away from that horrible negative memory. No, they walk a slow and steady walk towards Emmaus and they begin to chat. They take a slow walk. I, I don't know about you and what your processing is like. Um, I grew up in a family, especially the guys, the ladies chat perfectly. They process amazingly. 
And us dudes are men of few words. So we, uh, I would imagine, if we were in that time and we were processing on the WhatsApp group of me and my brothers, there's two others, um, if we were processing, it might look a little like this. Hey, bro, did you hear? What? Uh, Jesus died. Flip. Yeah, heard. Gutted. Crazy, me too. You okay? Don't know. Mm, me too. Chat soon. Mm. Wow. <laughs> sort of sound familiar? Right? Like the, the processing. That's it. It's cool. I've had my chat. My brothers and I, we, 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 we processed it. We, we dealt with that major loss that we went through. We're not sure how we're doing, but we, we spoke about it. Where did you speak? Oh, a WhatsApp, a group. And let me show you. No, that's it. And, and, and so many people process some really intense stuff in such shallow or insignificant words. And I want to, I suppose, invite you into a deeper, into a healthier version of processing. You see, Jesus wants something for you this morning. As we look at the way that Jesus moves towards these, these guys as they walk on the road, He wants something for you about the way that you deal with life, the way that you process the stuff that you're going through. There's so much that we go through all the time that we don't even always know we're going through it. That a turn in the economy and suddenly that puts your job in jeopardy. Hey, maybe the rumors across the, the, the workplace are that actually jobs, jobs are going to get cut in the next couple of days. Well, what do you do with that? You shove it down, pretend it's not happening. Maybe it is a loss of jobs. Hey, maybe the, the, you're at school and, and you know that the, the, the team sheets are coming out. And you're terrified. Is it going to be A, B, C or no team at all? And you're feeling this deep anxiety. Will I make it? Won't I make it? Will I be uh, included or not? Maybe it's not teams. Maybe it's something else. It's the results. It's the marks. Maybe the marks did come out. And they weren't what you hoped. Hey, maybe they were better than expected. What do you do with that? Are you allowing yourself to, to celebrate and to process that? And maybe it's the guilt of, a, of a, the way that you parent. Maybe the way you treat your parents. Maybe it's the, the reality of just something else about the relational challenges you're facing. Maybe it's the fear that actually every month, about halfway through the month, the income is over. And that is just killing you. I don't know what it is, but what I do realize is that our souls are a bit like a drawer. The image that I've got is in every home, usually, not every home, but most, there is a drawer or two. For some people, there's a whole cupboard. For others, there's a whole room that's dedicated to putting stuff that you don't know where it should go. Right? And uh, those of you, uh, any of you just got a whole room for that stuff? No? Yes? Too scared to tell me. Some of you have a cupboard. Most of us have a drawer, right? And in that drawer, there are things like the sewing kit, because where do you put a sewing kit? Um, most of them, uh, last uh, meeting, everyone said, that drawer's just too small. I mean, everyone's much bigger. You know, you've got the remote cover that you like, oh, well, I need one one day. You've got those slips in there that you're like, it's about six months. Do we keep it? Don't we? Are we ever going to send anything back on this? Maybe, maybe not. Do you need the slip anyway? Oh, string. I mean, it's too long to throw away. And you could use it again one day. Sunglasses, uh, straps that, you know, who knows when you might want to reuse that. Oh, the good old-fashioned bulb, which lives in every drawer. And you're thinking, is it used or is it not? Is it a load shedding one or not? Do I throw it or do I keep it? We'll never know until we plug it in. But then we've got to put some effort in. Oh, and what about all those cables that have come either with devices, with so many headphones. It's just never ends. And the good old key. Who knows what it opens. But you can never throw a key away. So they, they're endless, these drawers. And you could go, and if you dig further, they will keep showing things. And the problem with these drawers is that we never want to open them because they keep reminding us of how unsorted out our life is and that we wish we were neater like our friends, but we're not. We've got this drawer. And so much of our lives, our souls, are a bit like these drawers, whereby we just haven't quite processed stuff. 
And whether it is the job fear, whether it is the stuff that we've been through, whether it's the fear of a divorce or the concern about relationships or the parents' challenges that, that we're going through with them, whatever it may be, so often we shove it in the drawer of our souls. We don't talk about it. We don't pray about it. We don't process it. We put it down and we live in a way that ends up just feeling like a bit of a haze. We just don't experience the, the joy, the lightness, the health that we know Jesus would want for us. And we just keep living with the kind of heavy draw mentality. Terry Wardle talks about life and ministry. And he says, ministry is like a series of ungrieved losses. I looked at that and I thought, well, life is like a series of unprocessed relationships, joys, pains, and lessons that often go uncelebrated, ungrieved, and unlearned. How much of our lives just flying past us, getting dropped in the drawer, and we're not sure what to do with them. Beautiful movie called The Living. Maybe you've watched it, maybe you haven't. It's an elderly guy who gets to sort of the later stages of his life, and he doesn't know what to do. He has like an end-of-life crisis, and he wants to live, and he says this, I, I withdrew this cash to live a little. And then he carries on and says, but I don't know how. John Tyson commenting on, on this tragedy of not knowing how to live. He says, um, so many of us, we know what to do, what's, uh, you know, what's expected of us. We know how to show up for work. We know how to pay the bills. We know how to keep our heads down. We, you know, we do know what we are not allowed to do. But we don't know how to feel the pain and the wounds we medicated and repressed. We don't know how to celebrate with full abandon. We don't know how to mourn the things that we have lost. We don't know how to laugh at ourselves without getting defensive. And we've lost the ability to live sometimes. I want to suggest that as Jesus walks along the road, he does something so important in that he teaches these two disciples to process their lives and consequently how to live a full life. How to actually live. You know, in verse 17, he says, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Why does he ask that question? Why does he, you know, Jesus knows everything. He's the resurrected Messiah. With, you know, he, he's got full knowledge of everything. Why does he ask that? He asks that because he cares about their processing. He cares that they would open their mouths and begin to speak about what it is that they're going through. Isn't that an amazing thought? That of all the people that Jesus could have incarnated to after he was risen from the dead, he incarnates to two people who are walking on the road, processing their loss. It's almost as if Jesus has this gravitational pull towards people who have some big questions in life, who've got some great concerns about what matters in life, who are facing difficult things, and then process them in the name of Jesus. His gravitation moves towards people like that. Charles Spurgeon says, when two saints are talking together, Jesus is very likely to come and make the third one in the company. Talk of him, and you'll soon talk with him. Isn't it beautiful that Jesus wants to be spoken of? Not only that, he wants to then move in and help you to process what it is that you may be going through. The way I see it almost if you were to describe a cycle of our lives is that we start with, in a sense, losses and, and, and a kind of cycle of uh, things like losses, life experiences, unlearned lessons. You look at the top there and, uh, and really they just get jumbled up. Whether you've been through a tough day, a tough week, a tough life, they all get jumbled up into the drawer of your soul. And then what ends up happening is you've got them unfiled and unprocessed. In that moment when they're unfiled and unprocessed, you just go, well... I'm just normalizing the fact that my life feels a little like a haze. I just don't ever really feel deep peace. I don't ever feel that sense of deep calm. There's always a sense that I've just got some stuff that needs to be processed. It's unfiled. Claudia Elsig says, Emotional suppression happens when uncomfortable thoughts and feelings are pushed out of mind. People do this in a variety of ways, from using distraction like TV, or numbing through drugs, alcohol, uh, to overeating or controlling food intake. People often channel strong emotions into physical activity like boxing, running, or going to the gym. Uh, focusing our minds on something else sometimes helps us to forget what's really going on. We've got this habit, right, to just suppress it, push it away, pretend it's not happening. But what happens there is you get this growing uncertainty of what's really going on. 
Do I ever want to know what's going on? Maybe not. Shut the drawer. Let's not face that stuff. After that, you get low-level exhaustion. It kind of uh, manifests for different people. Some of us just walk around angry. Other people walk around anxious and just always a little on edge. Or maybe just a kind of low-level unease. That's just the, the experience of life. And because most of us are just not equipped, no one's ever taught us to process. No one's ever shown us. My brothers haven't taught me, and that's why we do what we do. And so we don't know how to go, how are you really doing? What's actually happening? Tell me more. I'm listening. What does that make you feel? How did that go? Tell me more about that. We don't have the equipping, and we're not being taught how to process our lives. And so what do we do because of all this stuff happening? We embrace our societal busyness, and we all just run on the hamster wheel of busyness, pretending none of that's happening. And we accumulate more and more and more and more of these experiences that we just chuck into the drawer of our souls. And consequently, life just feels more and more hazy, more and more hard to understand. Sound familiar? So what do we process? I think that's probably the, the question we need to ask. And I'll, I'll just run through a few things that, that are just need processing. You can't pretend they don't. They all need processing. And we pick them up in the passage that we've been reading. Firstly, we need to process our relational realities of life. Notice how in verse 14 they were talking with each other. And not only are they talking with each other relationally, they're talking about some real relational challenges that they've just been through. They lost a loved one. And so often, we don't want to talk about that. Maybe it's a feeling of betrayal. Maybe it's the fact that we hurt somebody else. Maybe there's a sense of, of just expectations that have been missed with regards to relationships. Maybe it's a painful breakup. And a fear, a fear of an impending divorce or something like that, or, or real relational breakdown. The point is, is that you can't just pretend it's not happening. We live in a society that are so good at pretending, trust me, I'm a pastor. That's the thing I do the most of, is walk with people and help them to see what's real. And so often, including myself, we are experts at pretending that's not really happening. That's not really happening. But it is. And so processing our relationships is to realize it actually is happening. Good leadership is to, is to show reality to someone and then to bring hope. And that's what Jesus does here. He goes, yes, you have lost. And then he begins to unpack the scriptures. He tells them what's real. Yes, but didn't you know? Okay, so much of good processing in your life will be to listen and to say, this is real. Or to face the real facts of where you are at with your relationships. It's not all bad, by the way. Sometimes we need to wake each other up, and I'll mention it, to celebrate, to go, do you see what just happened? I want to help you be grateful for what's just happened in your life. You're sort of like living all numb, like you didn't just get a promotion. Come on, crack the champagne, let's celebrate. Let's face what's going on relationally. That's the one thing. The other thing we need to process is real loss, and loss or grief. So much of our society is just learning to sweep it under the carpet or put it into the draw. Verse 19, they, Jesus asked, what are you talking about? They say, about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. This is difficult. We face difficulty. You face difficulty. It's part of life. You can't pretend you don't. I don't care how tough you are. I don't care how many businesses you've started. I don't care how big or small your bank balance is. It makes no difference to your ability or your need to process grief and loss. If you've lost something, it requires processing. It requires that you learn to face it and to talk about it. You're looking at a guy here who hasn't grown up doing a lot of that. It was the last sort of six years, just before COVID, that I began to explore the fact that I grew up in a world that had done very little processing and consequently had suppressed a whole bunch of pain and loss and grief that needed to be spoken about. South African men, we need the most help. But actually, South African society, in fact, the whole world, need help, need a prompt, need a provoke, 
can learn to process our losses. Ungrief pain turns into over-functioning for some people and, and retraction and isolation for others. What's your tendency when you're in grief? Do you pull away and not want anyone? Or do you over-function and start making sure that everyone around you succeeds? If you're a mom or a dad, you make sure your kids are involved in 95 extracurriculars and they're all getting A's all the time and you're getting promotions. And instead of facing the pain, you just try to succeed. That's a lot of people's uh, coping mechanism, by the way. Just get lots of external success and not face the fact that you need to slow down and face that you've been through some stuff. It usually leads to anger or resentment or bitterness, ultimately. Hey, the other thing we need to process is just lessons. Lessons that we could learn. It's neither good nor bad, it's just the fact that our life is sometimes moving so fast that we didn't realize that we just skimmed through something that could have been an amazing life lesson right there and there. Notice how Jesus says, how foolish. And then he went on to explain to them what had just happened. He taught them a lesson. He walked along slowly and he said, guys, didn't you realize that the Messiah was going to die? Remember Isaiah 53? That the Messiah would be the one who would, who would actually die a gruesome death, but it would be for our sins on our behalf so that we could be reconciled to God. Don't you remember that? And he goes on and he takes all the beautiful passages of the Old Testament and he explains that this is more than just a terrible moment on a cross. This was the fulfillment of the ages that was coming about. This was something that was making sense of their tears. This was the thing that was the beginning of the end of their pain and their grief and their loss. And he begins to embrace their pain, but also walks them through it. Hey, what lessons do you skim over? Maybe not log or journal. And take time sometimes to go, what did I just learn there? I made a mistake. I, I did something, but what could I have learned? It's the pace of your life so fast that you can't necessarily learn some lessons. I, I found um, in my journeying that probably the two things that I often need to ask myself in my personal journeying of learning lessons is, as I went through that, was that a sin that needed repenting? Or was that some brokenness that needs some healing? And uh, those are two really helpful questions as you go through something. Uh, we were talking about our marriage a while back, and uh, Nix and I went through a real tough time about six years ago where we called in some reinforcements. Um, we called Rigby and Sue, who kind of were giving oversight to us at the time, and we said, guys, we don't know if we want to plant this church anymore. We're two and three years in, and this is miserable. It's terrible. We're not having fun. Can somebody else come do this for us? Because we're not enjoying it. And it's hurting our marriage. It's hurting our lives. We just want out. And uh, it was an interesting process because one of the first things Rigby said to us was, hey guys, what did you expect? <laughs> it was really humbling, but it was really powerful because what happened in that moment was we went, oh yeah. I remember in 2014 when we said yes to this. We said, we know we're going to have moments we want to give up. We know we're going to have times where this is going to cause extra strain on our marriage. We know there's going to be times where this is going to feel like it's not worth it. But we've got to remind ourselves that God called us to this. Maybe we need to push through. And then into that we said, but what, with what's going on? What sin needs repenting and what brokenness needs healing? And we divided up and realized, hey, I wasn't being a great husband when it came to communication. That sin needed repenting. I am sorry, next. I'm not doing well here. We're processing. We're talking. Hey, what brokenness needs healing? Wow, we've lost three friends in this early stage of church planting. One moved to this country, another moved there, and we thought we had allies for life and suddenly we feel lonely. That's a brokenness. We need some healing there. That's disappointment, right? And you've got to talk about it. You've got to get some healing. You've got to get some help. That's the, the wonder of this thing. And so you find yourself talking with other people and getting some lessons that you can learn. The other thing we need to process in life are life's celebrations. Life celebrations. My sense of our society is that we're neither good at grieving our losses, nor are we great at celebrating the wins. And we need to do better at stretching ourselves into both spaces better, popping the champagne more often, and learning to recognize and see the wonders of the little things that go well. Learning to celebrate when we or our family members do something epic and are amazing. Notice how they say in verse 32, we're not our hearts burning inside of us as we walked with them. They're celebrating. They're going, wow. They call them in. They have a meal. They break bread. Their eyes are open. They go, this is the most epic moment of our lives. They're 
celebrate. They see something. Hey, do you take moments to celebrate, to see what's happening in front of you, to, to recognize the beauty of what God might be doing? Or has the victim mentality so overwhelmed you that you can't process that stuff? I want to maybe today call you out of that. So how do we do it? Let me briefly mention four ways to just make sure we're getting better at processing. Sound good? Yeah. Everyone alive, awake? Yeah. Great. Firstly, Create space by uh, changing your pace. By changing your pace. Probably my favorite fact about this story is that they walked. <laughs> they walked. I think so many of us are on the run of life. We're sprinting through life. And we're saying, Jesus, come, keep up with me. You'd, you'd really enjoy my life if you came with me. And Jesus says, no, I, I go at walking pace. I go with people who walk. And I want to encourage you today that there is one thing you can't force Jesus into, is into your pace. And if you want to grow as a processor of your life, you can't say, come Jesus, come run with me. So often Jesus is walking on the beach and he says, come follow me. He doesn't negotiate on the pace. He loves you. He'll keep, he'll keep going with you. He'll care for you at, at, at 100 miles an hour. But if you want to engage with him, if you want to know His presence and His power, if you want to process and be filled with the Spirit in the way that Jesus would have you do so, I want to encourage you to slow down. I want to encourage you to slow down to Jesus' pace. That doesn't mean that you can't work a high-functioning job. It doesn't mean that you don't have to get the kids to school on time. It just means that you need to process what you're doing, particularly with the gaps of your life. The gaps are some of the most contested spaces in our society, and they are very difficult to, uh, to not fill up with stuff. Uh, researchers at Netflix have found that the typical subscriber doesn't, if the typical subscriber doesn't find something to watch in 60 to 90 seconds, they could lose interest and move on to something else, like a video game, a book, or even, God forbid, old-fashioned TV. <laughs> the point is, is it's the attention economy. If it's not Netflix, then it's going to be one of the many other people who want your attention. It's your phone, it's your colleagues, it's your emails, it's your WhatsApps. All the gaps of your life are being contested for. There are huge people who want your attention. And so what used to be a 13 kilometer walk has turned into a frantic head down. I will never process my life. I will never face that stuff. I will skim the surface of life. I will catch the fastest tram to get there as long as I don't have to process. And every voice around you Every piece of technology is trying to say, that's great. Don't slow down. Don't put the phone down. Don't empty out those gaps. Don't go for a walk on the beach with a friend and say, I just need to talk with someone. I'm not even sure what I need to talk about. I just need an hour. I just want to sit and have a beer and just, hey, can I listen to you? You mentioned that you're going through a lot. Slow down and be present to each other and listen. Uh, marathon runners call it the wall. When you come to a point and you just can't run any further. You were running at a good pace, and the legs that once worked now hit 28 or 30 k's. You still got 12 to go, and they're not working anymore. If you run at an unsustainable pace, and your life is just flying from one thing to the next, ultimately it'll be relationships, or it will be physical dynamics. Something will come, and you will hit a wall, and you'll realize, I can't sustain it. I can't keep up a marriage and a parenting or a, or a, a job like this and a, a meaningful engagement in Christian community. I can't do it all. Something has to give. And you hit the wall. And when you hit the wall, say, Roger, I remind you, you told me about this wall. <laughs> no, don't do that. Just say, Jesus, thank you for helping me. Let me find a new place. I want to walk with you. I want to be the kind of person who can process well. Curry Ten Broom once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Mm. Secondly, process proactively. Process proactively. Intentional processing, just processing will not happen by accident. This is just the fact. If you've gone through stuff in life and you're learning to become a better celebrator and a griever of losses, let me promise you it doesn't just happen. It requires a bit of intentionality. Yes, you monitor your pace, but you also monitor what exactly are you processing? What do you need to face? What do you need to think about? What stuff needs processing? 
They realized they had a list of stuff. We had a Messiah. We had hoped he would be our, 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 our king. We, we watched him, and, and now we're feeling traumatized by what we saw. And we've got some hopes that are being dashed, and we don't know now what to think about the future. We thought he was going to change our whole future. They've got language for what they were going through. Once they'd finished chatting, there's a good chance they might have written it down in a journal. If you've got a journal, uh, use it. If you don't, maybe buy one. Uh, to, to learn to process what you're going through, what you're facing. Uh, one of my favorite lines that has become true for me is to, to realize that it's never nothing. You go, what do you mean by it's never nothing? You know when you're feeling stuff and you, you've got maybe, for me, it's a knot in my stomach. And I go, I've had this knot for about an hour. I'm getting quite good at this now. It's taken me years, but I'm getting quite good at it. I go, I've got a knot in my stomach. And I first, the first thing I go is it's never nothing. I'm feeling this because something happened. Something happened. So let me get intentional. What has happened? And I go back half an hour. I go, uh, okay, I had a phone call. No, that phone call was great. Then I go back. Okay, I got an email. Oh, yeah. I got an email. And in that email, they alluded to the fact that somebody was really disappointed with the way that I treated someone else. <coughs> and what I did was I wrote the reply and I pushed send. But what I didn't realize that I didn't process the fact that I, somebody was really disappointed. And an hour later, I've got this knot in my stomach and I'm turning into anger. And I only realized that when Nick walked into the door and said, uh, how are you doing? And I said, leave me alone. <laughs> and then I realized, why am I, it's not her, she did nothing. She asked me how I'm doing. This is metaphoric, this hasn't really happened. But I realized I'm, I'm on edge. Because I'm angry, because I thought I, because somebody thinks I hurt them, and I didn't close the loop, and I didn't follow through, and I didn't process. And so what's happened is I've just got a knot. The point is, it's never nothing. When you've got something, you're feeling something, you're stressed, you're anxious, slow down. Get proactive and go, what has happened? You'll find that in the beginning, you're like, Rose, this is going to take me forever. I'm going to spend my life going, whoa. Well, maybe you will in the beginning, but you'll find that you get better at it. And the muscle grows and your sharpness for processing your life gets better to the point that you've got short gaps between that happened, I need to forgive. That happened, I need to chat. That happened, oh, I can move on. It's just actually a piece of string. And I don't actually need the string. Who needs it? Moving on. It's just the thing. It's in the drawer. Take it out and move on. Oh, it's actually, it's a, it's a bolt and it works. I need to get, I need to plug it in. It's a part of my life I need to use. Process proactively. It's never nothing. Thirdly, process through prayer. They talked with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? I don't know if you are a good prayer or not. The church has probably often made us feel like prayer is a discipline. And I want to suggest that we're all very good at talking to ourselves. And one of the encouragements when it comes to processing is to take our self-talk and turn it into God conversation. The best way to learn how to pray uh, in the scriptures is one, Look at every single prayer that you can find in the scriptures and it'll teach you how to pray. You'll just learn like that. The other way to learn how to pray is to look at all the interactions that Jesus' disciples had with, uh, with him. Because every time a person talks to Jesus, it's a form of prayer, right? Talking to God. That's what's happening. They go, Jesus, there's, no, uh, there's only water, no wine. What must we do? <coughs> That's, that's a learning to pray. That's how you pray. Jesus, there's no money at the end of the month. What do I do? Jesus, I'm worried about my parents' marriage. What do I do? Jesus, I am delighted, but I'm nervous to celebrate because I don't want to look proud. What do I do? You're processing. You're praying. You're talking to God. Process through prayer. And then process finally, last one, is with the right people. Process with the right people. Learn to build relationships with people that you can begin to become a processor, both with people where you're processing with their stuff and you're learning to process your stuff with them. Hey, it's one of the most wonderful gifts of life and community is that we're building friendships on beaches, through beers and coffees and whatever else it is that you like to do where you can spend uninterrupted slow time that's like walking on a road to a mess where you can simply listen. I often uh, meet with people at our Bloberg beachfront, and at the end they go, this is amazing, man. Well, you've got like such a gift. I go, I promise you I don't. I go, wow, how did that make you feel? That's interesting. Tell me more. How did that make you feel? That's interesting. Tell me more. That's interesting. How did that make you feel? Tell me more. <laughs> and by the end of that, people go, that was so good. Thank you. 
Why? Because somebody just listened. We're just learning to love each other by letting people process with us and not always waiting for them to finish the sentence and solve the problem. We just process. We just listen. How are we doing at processing with and uh, alongside other people? As I land, I'm going to uh, take us through a word of prayer, but I just want to encourage you that if you feel like the drawer is so cluttered, it's so messed up in there, you don't know how you would ever open the drawer of your soul, the stuff in there just feels too complex, I want to suggest that there are so many options for you to begin to process. The first place has to be that you just pray to God. You just pray to go, God, I'm not even sure how. I'm not even sure how. As they approached the village in verse 28, they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. Listen to what he said, and the day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Jesus knows exactly what's inside the drawer of your life. He's not intimidated. He's under no illusions. My drawer's as messy as yours. There's no one here who's got a clean, neat drawer of their life where it's all processed and neat and filed and perfect. But he doesn't mind walking in with you. He'll go in. He's so kind. That's why he died on the cross. That's the point of it. I don't know if you remember, but when Jesus is on the cross, one of the, the most remarkable things happened in that when Jesus was on the cross, he all and when Jesus lived his life, he always spoke to God as his Father. It's an amazing thing. Father, Father this, Father that. And there's only one time he doesn't relate to God as Father. It's in that incredible moment where he looks up and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Suddenly the guy who processed his life with prayer and with people, he knew how to celebrate at weddings and turn water into wine. He knew how to weep tears of blood. He knew the full gambit of what it meant to process in a remarkable way. He suddenly loses it and what he says is, God, why have you forsaken me? That's a very significant moment. Because in that moment, he traded his ability to process so that we could have it given to us. He gave up everything of his ability to, to have it his way and he said, I will lose it so that they can have it. He died the sinless one so that us and all our sinful junk with all the stuff in our drawers could have acceptance before God the Father. So that when our drawer feels so messed up and so broken and so beyond anything we'd ever want to open, we can say, Father, because he was forsaken on our behalf. That's the confidence we have. That's the wonder of what's going on here. And I'd love to encourage you to take this moment to just slow down and to feel the compassion of Jesus, to feel the love of Christ. He would love to come in. He wants to come into your day. He finds great delight. He break bread. The bread was a symbol of his broken body, his deep love. And so I'm going to pray for us. Does that sound good? Mm, Let's yeah. pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that it's your pleasure to come into our lives. And thank you that it's our privilege to process our lives. I do pray for every person here, myself included that we would see that what's in the drawer of our lives is not beyond repair and it is worth opening. And I pray that we with confidence and faith would open the drawer and let you and others in that we might walk towards health and healing, towards faith and increasing freedom, that the things we become so normal about we're so used to the knot in our stomach, so used to the lack of peace. I pray that we would no longer be okay with that. I pray that we would learn to listen to you and listen even to the, our body that says, this is not okay, and to process and to learn to become better at having short accounts with you, with others, learning to forgive quickly, learning to find healing more speedily, learning to see what you're doing with us. Teach us the power of a well-processed life. I pray, help us, Holy Spirit. This is a journey that maybe I've capitalized some of us starting, but it's not the end, it's the beginning of a life of learning to process well. To that end, we invite your help, Holy Spirit, 
that we might do this better and better for your glory and for the, the sake of the lives we want to live, walking in step with your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.